answer prayers that relates to health. Uh, it's so good to see um, the Malones here. It's so good to see the Patelzics here. It's so good to see the Carols here. Uh, we're mindful of others that continue to battle with ailments and difficulties. We think about uh, Sheena and the Taylors and what they're going through. We think about the Tierces and what George is going through and struggling with. We're mindful, Father, of those that have chronic ailments and issues. We're also mindful, Father, and thankful for uh, thy many answered prayers. And so grateful to be able to see uh, those that are here this morning. Father, we love thee. We need thee. We're indebted to thee. We trust in thee. We're so thankful for the gift of thy son. We pray all these things in his name. Amen. All right, looking here at the tabernacle. So remember, we're going here through the books of the Old Testament, Old Testament Simplified. Brother Rob Whitaker uh, laying out for us kind of a book-by-book -book study um, and looking here uh, specifically now at Exodus and diving a little deeper as we think about the tabernacle. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through this work done by Jason Hilburn. And you see there uh, what's up on the screen. Um, this is the New Testament parallel to what uh, was built and uh, how worship was conducted under the Old Testament tabernacle system. Um, and um, we're going to, Jason certainly is not the first to have uh, laid this out. Uh, Rob Whitaker is not the first to have laid this out in this way. Um, and, and we're not the first to make this parallel at all. Um, let's go to the scripture as it relates to this connection. And let's begin in Hebrews. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, and if someone could read for me there, uh, verses 1 through 4. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Okay, so you think a little bit about what is being established here in the Pentateuch as we're going through the Old Testament, and as we see animal sacrifices taking place, as we see the law of Moses being established in the book of Exodus, uh, and as we see the details of the Old Testament system being laid forth, um, what was the purpose of all of that, and what uh, was the aim of all of that. You think about what Paul writes to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 3. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, um, let's look there. And um, let's look beginning there in verse 24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Uh, and so uh, the Old Testament system, uh, the Old Testament system of faith, remember faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10 and verse 17. Uh, the Old Testament um, way of faith, the Old Testament system of faith, that was a schoolmaster or a tutor. The idea is one that would shadow or bring a student to the teacher. Um, that's what the Old Testament was doing. Uh, ultimately, Christ being the one and the goal of it all. You look also at the book of Romans, Romans chapter 10 and verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. End or the goal, the purpose, the aim. Uh, Jesus Christ was the aim, was the goal, was the end of the Old Testament. So, the whole reason why all of the Old Testament was established the way in which it was is because God was planning and preparing and bringing about something else. The, the purpose was not for the Old Testament system. And you saw that as Corey read a few minutes ago in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, the Old Testament being a shadow. And so you think about, uh, and we've made this connection before, if I wanted to eat an apple and all of a sudden I'm looking for an apple and I come across 
uh, the shadow of an apple tree and I see the shadow of an apple being cast on the ground. I'm not interested in the shadow of that apple. I'm not going to go down and try to eat or uh, be nourished by that shadow. It's not possible. But ultimately, I'm going to look up from that shadow to the ultimate um, structure that is casting uh, and making that shadow possible to be cast. And so um, the Lord provided to us a shadow of things to come in the Old Testament. Uh, those things were not the end. Those things were not the goal. Those things were intended to bring us to what the mission, uh, the eternal mission of God is, which is uh, salvation via the gospel in Jesus Christ and his church. You think about what we find, for example, in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, starting there in verse uh, 10, uh, Paul writes, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so the eternal purpose is salvation in the gospel via Jesus Christ in the church that he built. And so you see what is laid up here, uh, Jason Hilburn having kind of constructed this based upon what we find uh, in the book of Exodus and what we find in uh, the New Testament. So let's go through a couple of these things. And we, we, a few years ago, I think, went through this as well. Uh, but if someone could read for me Exodus chapter 38. Exodus chapter 38. Uh, and let's read verses 9 through 20. Exodus 38, verses 9 through 20. Thank you, brother. So, uh, question. If we were coming here this morning and we were to construct this, uh, if this is the way we operated today, think about the denominational world, religious world out there, how, how would this be dealt with? How would these details be evaluated, responded to? Huh? Ah, that's not very important. Ah, this is, I mean, this is way too narrow-minded here. Hey, I mean, you know what? Uh, look, I know it says west side, but it doesn't have to be west side. I mean, it, uh, look, let's have an argument and debate and write 17 different papers and, you know, get degrees because, you know, we think actually that the fine twine linen should actually be a different type. But no, that's not what they did back here. Oh, yeah. 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You think about the idolatrous world that they came out of. Uh, you think about the idolatrous world that is round about them. Hey, I mean, this is so just, what is this? Look at the idols. Look at what they get constructed for them. God doesn't know what he's talking about. We want to do it better. That's not how they responded. Chapter 39, verse 42, According to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so the children of Israel made all the work. Verse 43, And Moses did look upon all the work, and behold, they had done it as the Lord had commanded. Even so had they done it, and Moses blessed them. I mean, God is crystal clear here. I told them what to do, and they did it. Now, do you think they've been woken up a little bit that God means business? You just had a situation where Moses went up to the mount. God tells Moses to go back down. Why? What's going on? They messed up big time. They created a golden calf. And, oh, look, we just threw in our metal and this golden calf popped out. And we just decided to worship it. And we want to go back to Egypt. And we don't know what we're doing here. And guess what? A bunch of people died. They were disobedient. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Does God care about whether or not we do what he says as relates to worship? Absolutely. I mean, that's not me being rigid. That's not me being, you know, overly, you know, narrowly, narrow-minded. That's what the Bible is showing us. That's what the Bible lays out for us. These things are our examples in the context, by the way, of Paul referencing these very events in the book of Exodus in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. He states there in verse 11, now all these things happened unto them for examples. He likewise says the same in verse 6, now these things were our examples. So I read the Old Testament and I gain something. What do I gain? God means business. The details matter. I need to fear God. Most people say, well, why do we study the Old Testament? Why do we go through all these details? Why, why did we just read verses 9 through 20? All those nitty gritty details. That's right. He wants us to follow his instructions and he shows us what happens when we don't. And he shows us how detailed he is. And then he expects us to follow it. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. What Holy Scriptures did Timothy know as a child? The Old Testament. What is the Old Testament for? Which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Uh, sometimes people say, well, you know, Old Testament is just confusing. It's just, you know, you get bogged down with the Old Testament. Old Testament's for people that are, you know, senior citizens, not for young people, not for people that, you know, just need it simplified. No, the Old Testament is helpful to learn. Even as a child, God means business. Let's do what God says. And so you think about what the Hebrews writer wrote in Hebrews chapter 8 regarding this tabernacle. Notice there in verse 4, uh, excuse me, in verse uh, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, referencing there the priests, referencing there again this system, notice verse 3, verse 4, what are they serving for? A shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For, see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. I have a question. If God was so particular as to how the shadow was constructed, does he care about how we do things today, being that we're not the shadow, we're the actual goal? <laughs> Church of Christ? To give this idea that, quote, the God of the Old Testament is different than, quote, the God of the New Testament, which flies in the face of what the Bible teaches us, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
But to paint that picture and somehow get the idea that God is more rigid in the Old Testament and, and less rigid in the New Testament, that the New Testament isn't that big of a deal, we don't pay ten, close, close attention to the details. No, no. The Bible gives us clear direction that what's in the New Testament is even more serious, is even better than that which is in the Old Testament. Well, you see, when you're when you're dealing with people, sure. Right. Right. Sure. Sure. Right. Right. Sure. Right. Right. All of a sudden, every other vein of logic gets thrown out the window. Uh, but what you see here is the outer court being laid out for us. Uh, what is the outer court? Um, notice here, uh, John chapter 6 and verse 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Notice also what Paul states in 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. Uh, Paul states there regarding Christ and what he did. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Um, Jesus was in the world. Uh, he was in this outer court. Uh, let's look at the altar of burnt offering. If someone could read Exodus 38 verses 1 through 7. Exodus 38 verses 1 through 7. All right, thank you so much. So the altar of burnt offering uh, is, is set there in the outer court. Um, and again, uh, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, John chapter 1 and verse 29. Um, let's also look at the laver. So let's read Exodus 29 and verse 4. Exodus 29 and verse 4, I'll read that. If someone can get ready for me, Exodus 30 verses 17 through 21, Exodus 30, verses 17 through 21. This is Exodus 29 and verse 4. Exodus 29 and verse 4, And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and shalt wash them with water. Notice also verse 21 of the same chapter. And thou shalt take of the blood that is upon the altar, and of the anointing oil, and sprinkle it upon Aaron and upon his garments, and upon his sons, and upon the garments of his sons with him, and he shall be hallowed, and his garments, and his sons, and his sons' garments with him. All right, if someone could read 30, verses 17 through 21.
All right, thank you. And then chapter 40 and verse 12, And thou shalt bring Aaron and his sons unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and wash them with water. Yeah, any, anyone see a connection here? <laughs> Anything? Uh, you see there, of course, water baptism. So you, you already know the answer. Um, obviously, we can go through several passages here. Uh, you look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. Uh, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth, na- doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, baptism, essential uh, in order for one to become a priest, in order for one to become a child of God, in order for one to be able to worship God in spirit and in truth, uh, in the church, being added to the church, all right? Yes? Right. Amen. 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 Absolutely. Amen. Uh, that's right. And, and as a matter of fact, if you notice, as we were reading through that, um, what was the consequence if they did not... Um, follow out and do what God had commanded them. Uh, We read it just a few minutes ago. They would die. That's right. Uh, Exodus chapter, let's see, which one was it? It was 40 and verse. No. No. Was it 30? Uh, yes. That they die not. That's right. Um, Exodus 30 and verse 20. Exodus 30 and verse 20. Again, who is it that we're worshiping? Who is God? Creator, sustainer, eternal, deity. He he is the one true and only source of life. So, you know, man wants to be flippant about this. Sister Malone's point in the Old Testament... You had to follow God's instructions in order to worship Him, and if you did not, you died. Uh, In order to be in the kingdom, in order to be in the church, in order to be able to be a priest of God, worshiping Him in spirit and in truth, one must be a child of God. Uh, Again, you think about our world today, and there viewpoint, that's eh, not a big deal. Not a big deal. Uh, they're doing it their way. They're not doing it God's way. Uh, all right, what about the holy place? The holy place. Let's look at a couple of verses here. Exodus chapter 26. Exodus chapter 26, starting there in verse 33. And thou shalt hang up the veil under the um, catches that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil the ark of the testimony and the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. Look at Exodus 29 and verse 30. Exodus 29 and verse 30. And that son that is priest in his stead shall put them on seven days when he cometh into the tabernacle of the congregation to minister in the holy place. Look at Exodus 31 and verse 10. Exodus 31 and verse 10. And the cloths of service and the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office. Um, This is where the holy washed sanctified people of God are. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1. And if someone could read for me there, 15 through 16. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 through 16.
Is that First Peter chapter one? That's all right. That's all right. First Peter chapter one, verses fifteen through sixteen. That's all right. All right, let's look at chapter 2 and verse 5. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Uh, let's look also at verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his Marvelous light. Um, Peter here is writing the church. Uh, is he writing unmarried clergy? I have a question. Is Peter, who are priests in the denominational world? Unmarried clergy, right? Catholic church. Is he writing unmarried clergy? I mean, he just said, you are a holy priesthood, verse 5. Verse 9, you are a royal priesthood. Who is he writing here? Right. Chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, ye wives. Wait a second. Ye wives. Be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word... They also may without the word be won by the conversation of their wives. While they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or a, or a putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with amazement, with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Sounds like the priesthood that Peter is writing includes husbands and wives. Uh, we are God's priests in the church. The church is the holy place. And what took place in the holy place uh, under the Old Testament, under this tabernacle system? Uh, let's look at Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25, if someone could read for me there, 31 through 40. Exodus 25, 31 through 40. Of pure gold, for a talent of pure gold shall he make it, which 
all these vessels. And look at how much, and look at how to make them after their pattern, which they feared to be in the, in the mouth. All right, thank you, brother. Uh, and so, again, the specificity here of this piece that is going to bring light, the golden candlestick, uh, the golden lampstand, and you overlay that into what we find in the New Testament. You think about 1 John chapter 1, for example. 1 John chapter 1, uh, starting there in verse 5, John writes, This uh, then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us, cleanseth us from all sin. Uh, Psalm 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Uh, you think about what Paul commands Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. You think about what Paul commands the elders in Ephesus in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Um, what is it that sustains us, that gives us visibility, that gives us clarity, that gives us understanding in the New Testament system. The Word of God, which is our light. Uh, is it needful that what we are doing this morning is studying the Bible? <laughs> yes. Is it needful that what comes from the pulpit, uh, the elders of the congregation are uh, mindful and sensitive as to whether or not it is the Word of God and the Gospel in its entirety is being declared? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, again, you look at that specificity, and then you ask yourself, how sensitive are, quote, preachers today regarding the specificity of what's being declared from the pulpit? Does book, chapter, verse matter? Does specificity in what God's Word says matter? If God cared so much regarding the shadow as to whether or not all the materials and particulars were exact as it relates to a lampstand, when you think about the actual substance being the Word of God declared in the church, God care? Absolutely. Sure, sure. And you think about your job, for example. I'm sure some owners would not be happy if you just kind of flippantly went in there and just did whatever and didn't pay attention to the way things were to be done. Uh, these things matter. But for some reason, they seem to matter when it's our doing and concerning our interests. But what about God's interests? <laughs> Uh, we see the, the parallel that it matters. So the golden lampstand. You have the table of showbread, Exodus chapter 25, uh, 23 through 30. The table of showbread being laid out. Um, what is it that we partake on a weekly basis? The priest would partake of the showbread once per week, uh, being called a memorial. Leviticus chapter 24, 5 through 9. That sounds similar. Uh, Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, uh, the disciples came together on the first day of the week to break bread, um, the showbread, and what is the memorial? What is it that we are, what is the word memorial reference, a remembrance? What is it that we're remembering? The sacrifice of Christ, of course. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 20 and following. Um, and then you have the altar of incense, Exodus chapter 30, verses 1 through 9, uh, also being there in the holy place. Uh, incense was offered by the priest during the Old Testament. Um, what is it that we find parallel to that 
under the New Testament. Let's look at Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8, starting there in verse 3. Uh, and another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Uh, you see there a connection. Look also at uh, Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 8. Uh, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden uh, vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. The prayers of the saints. And so, um, look, having been a formal Catholic, I can tell you, uh, within the halls of uh, their buildings, there's a stench. And the stench is a result of the priests, clergy, going around, swinging, letting incense flow about the building. Uh, that's not what we find in the New Testament. That's not what we find in the New Testament. Uh, our prayers offer up uh, like, like unto incense uh, to God. Uh, thank you all very much for the class.